If my cholesterol is high, when should I start paying attention to dietary cholesterol? There's really no correlation with dietary cholesterol and serum cholesterol. They were giving rabbits eggs, which rabbits don't eat eggs. From those animal model studies, we've extrapolated that, oh, well, dietary cholesterol must increase serum cholesterol. Serum cholesterol is linked with heart disease, so therefore we should reduce dietary cholesterol. But there's not really good human evidence. There was a recently published study and looked at which food groups impact serum cholesterol. It turns out coffee, green tea actually increase cholesterol. I generally tell people don't worry about dietary cholesterol. Saturated fat is a little bit different story though. There's not a lot of good data to link saturated fat with heart disease. If you go from a carnivore diet to a plant-based diet, your LDL will go down. <laughs> but does that mean that your risk of heart disease also goes down? And that's very questionable. Will I feel the morning wood? Because no, I took no. two capsules. Better question, will I feel your morning wood? <laughs> if you want to. <laughs> it's only if you want it. <laughs> you yeah. took it already? I took two capsules. This said take Whoa. three, but I don't want to get too hard I, on the mic. Should I back up? <laughs> no, no. It's it's one of these things like ne supplements and, and adaptogens take time. You know, mm. so this would be something you notice after three or four days. Mm. Okay. But yeah, but it's interesting. I mean, some of the customers that call in, it's usually their partner that notices that the men are a little bit more hard, a little bit more more drive, more desire. And so that it's been a word of mouth. Wow. Like how, how long you had your supplement company for? Since 2019. Yeah. Cool. And what, what kind of made you uh, decide to jump into that? Because it's going to be super competitive. It's Yeah, it's very competitive. Well, I was on the sales side for a lot of years, helping other people get their products off the ground with custom manufacturing. So I represented a manufacturer since 2006. So I helped other people take their ideas and build their own custom formulas. And then after seeing a lot of brands take off and be very successful, I'm like, well, I know what to do. Why mm -hmm. don't I just do it myself? But I had a little bit of the imposter syndrome, didn't know all the aspects of business, but just started with just a couple of SKUs um, and then just took it from there. So it's uh, not often that we have people coming in with research papers. Mm. Mike came prepared here today. I think nice. uh, sharing some of these uh, research papers, I think could be really cool, especially this first one uh, where you were talking to me a little bit about exercise. Yeah, this is really incredible. This uh, researcher, Edward Coyle at UT Austin, he's talked a lot about exercise resistance from inactivity. And so all of us here, we like, like to go to the gym and work out and put in the time with resistance training. But a lot of folks do that, then they sit for the rest of the day. And mm -hmm. it turns out that being inactive and they define inactivity as walking less than 8,000 steps per day. And so for, for every 1,000 steps, we don't walk off of 8,000. So let's just say you get 6,000 steps per day. That will increase your risk of dying by 15% for every 1,000 steps you don't get. So 8,000 minus you know, 1,000, that's increased your risk of 15%. So we can most people are, are just walking like 3,500 steps per day. So they're increasing their risk of dying from all causes or heart disease relative to the 8,000 step per day walkers mm -hmm. by some 100%. So it's like a 100% a, a fold increase, mm. increasing their odds of dying from all causes. So activity is really, really important in addition to exercise. So I think it's important that we, that we differentiate that. And so Edward Coyle and colleagues have been studying the effects of forcing people to be sedentary for three days Ugh. and then having them exercise for one hour and before their high fat meal, because a high fat meal will... In, induce what's called postprandial hyperlipidemia. And so this an inability to metabolize fat properly. So to give these subjects a milkshake and see how physical activity beforehand helps them metabolize that milkshake. And if they've been sedentary, even if they do one hour of, of high intense exercise, it doesn't offset the deleterious effects of being physically inactive. So I think it's really important just for people because they hear, I need to go to the gym and go to the gym, but then they sit all day. And so that is uh, really an important aspect. And Mark, I mean, you and both of you have been talking about this for a long time with these 10-minute walks with Stan. We talk a lot about microdosing on the show and we're not talking about mushrooms. We're talking about microdosing, exercise, yeah. trying to get in some forms of exercise. We had Brad Kern on the show years ago who said that he just, he doesn't really love to lift. You can kind of tell. I'm just kidding, Brad. Um, but but he, you're not kidding, though. He, he, I, I'm not kidding. I'm kidding. I'm not kidding. He had a curl bar that was like near his car. And every time he walked past the curl bar, he would just do a couple sets. So I think whatever way somebody can, somebody can buy a kettlebell, whatever way you can kind of microdose some sort of exercise into your life. Um, I, I think what I try to share with people is uh, no amount is too small. Right. So I think we have a tendency to think like, ah, I only got like three or four minutes. I probably shouldn't even bother. I think you should bother. I think you should do it. 
Yeah. That's great. I mean, one of the things that I've been doing, life's been really busy. I have a daughter and growing a business and things like that. If I only have 20 minutes to go to the gym, then later that day, I'll do some push-ups or military push-ups, handstand walks, just break it up and just spreading. And we talked about this a couple of years ago with, with both of you, you know, that spreading that fatigue over the course of the week. And I think even over the course of the day is better. And so I just think it's important that we have these studies because so many people are seemingly concerned about their health. You know, you go to the airport now, people have hand sanitizer on their backpacks, they're wearing masks on the airplanes, but but are they enumerating or quantifying their step count? Most people aren't. I know a lot of us are. I, I aim for between 10 and like 14,000 steps per day. I just find I feel so much better. But it's cool to see now we have objective data. We have research showing. And there was one study in 220,000 people, Bannock et al. out of the UK found that when people start to hit over that 10,000 steps per day, arthritis, depression, anxiety, high blood pressure, like all the things that people are suffering from, they're swallowing aspirins, ibuprofens, antidepressants, all these things, um, a, a, a gastrointestinal reflux. You know, this is, these are very common conditions. They can be amelior ameliorated by just walking, you know? It's not like it's the sine qua non. I mean, we still have to lift weights. We got to get in the sun. But this is, I think, something that we can all, there's not really a, you don't have to, buy a gym membership to go walk after a meal, just 10 yeah, minutes. You want more bang for your buck, try to do it outside. If yeah. you're trying to couple it and make it uh, a little bit more like exercise, maybe you find some hills, maybe you find some trails, maybe you throw on a weighted vest. Yeah. And it's funny because anecdotally, like for, for myself, I could totally kind of agree with that because every time, like I've made, I've tracked the days that I get like maybe 5,000, 6,000 steps versus the days I get like 13, 14. Yeah. HRV is always better the next morning. Sleep quality is always better. Uh, physical recovery always is better because like I do a lot of grappling, et cetera. And the walking always helps me feel better the next day. So it's, it's like, it's one of those things where you don't expect that simple act to make such a big difference, but it does. And if you're someone who like wears an Apple watch or an aura ring or whatever, Pay attention to it. Like, yeah. look at the days that you got more steps and you were outside a little bit more and then look at the days that you did and then see, try to see if there's a trend difference. Yep. And what I love about walking is if you wear a continuous glucose monitor, which I know you guys have dabbled with, it's so impressive to see how that can drop your glucose. You know, I mean, we, we know all about metabolic health now and that's emerging as a, a key factor for depression, anxiety. <laughs> Wearing those things is super interesting because like if you lift, then your blood sugar goes up. Right. But if you go on a walk, it goes down. Like it's kind of confusing. You're like, what the hell's going on here? Right. But I think that's where having critical thinking and realizing that that resistance training is naturally glycolytic. So it's going to increase, but it it's going to drop for an extended period of time after. Like it's gonna squish your baseline level so it's down. Doing so for a, for a need because you're burning carbo or the mitochondria, I guess, is burning carbohydrates during exercise, burning glucose, sugar, right? Right. Yeah. And something even like acute stress. The first time I wore it in 2016, I went through an airport in Toronto and they don't honor TSA pre or anything like that. And so I was worried that I was going to miss my flight. We we're just tr talking about traveling. And um, I was sitting there sweating. I was looking at my glucose monitor. It was like 90, 95, 110. It got up to 160, but then it dropped right back down. But just that effect of cortisol and adrenaline short term you know, it increases your glucose, these counter-regulatory hormones. Being um, reduced to standing in line with normal folks. <laughs> I know it's disgusting. I agree. Well, <laughs> this way, well, so I was going to Pass a conference, <laughs> going to a conference and I was like, if I miss this flight, this is the only flight. To lose. I was going from Toronto to Winnipeg and it was like the one flight and I'm like, oh man, I'm going to miss this thing. My gosh. And so my stress was going crazy. Um, but it was cool to see it come back down and drop. Um, so anyway, going back to walking, I think that's very beneficial. And the other thing about glucose, since we, you talked about heat and cold yesterday with Tom Seeger, um, that actually transiently increases your glucose, but then over time drops it as well. So that's another tool people mm. can use. Sauna, contrast therapy is naturally really good for metabolic health as well. So, What's the importance of uh, DHA? You were mentioning a little bit about that before the show. Yeah, so DHEA is a hormone that our adrenal glands make. And it turns out this hormone is a precursor molecule to I'm both- I'm sorry, did you say DHEA or DHA? D DHEA, yeah, this is a DHEA. common- DHEA. DHEA. Gotcha, so, okay. So we have the omega-3 fats, the fish oil, the long chain, 20 and 22 carbon long, respectively, fatty acids, EPA, eicosapentaenoic acid, DHA, doca sahexaenoic acid, really good for cardiovascular health, which we can get into- good for pregnancy, good for brain health, um, and uh, CTE prevention as well. So these are fish oils that are, that are and they're, they're, we found them, we see them in red meat, 
uh, salmon that we had this morning, uh, fish oil. But we're talking about the hormone DHEA, uh, dihydroepiandosterone. And so this is a precursor. Well, what's unique about DHEA is it has direct hormonal effects and it's also a precursor to testosterone. But unlike testosterone and estrogen, this starts to decline first. And so for people that are considering HRT or they want to put on more muscle as they get older, by the time you are 60 or 70, your DHEA levels are about 10% of what they are compared to your, in your 20s. And so this is, I think, something that's highly underrecognized, uh, especially young men who are in their 30s or 40s and are like, man, I feel like I should go on HRT. Like something's not right. My libido's not there anymore. I just had a child. I'm getting fatter on the middle. All the signs of low T. I think DHEA should be something they should address first because if DHEA is low, testosterone will absolutely be low. How do you naturally get that uh, DHEA up uh, maybe without just uh, supplementing it? Is it in food or anything like that? Or It's not. That's the thing. Well, and so that is an interesting argument. If it naturally declines at around 25, should we be increasing it? And my thought process is because we're all exposed to plastics and endocrine disrupting chemicals and circadian rhythm disruption from cell phones, I think it, optimizing our hormones is beneficial. Um, and, and if you look at hormonal levels of men, you know, just 50 years ago, they are some 30 to 40% higher, you know, compared to age match controls. How now. do we have that information? Like I, I've heard that thrown around a lot and people are like, oh, you know, people like a hundred years ago, their testosterone was probably like, you know, 20, you know, 2000 or whatever. How do we like, do we know this for sure? Like, or is there real science behind that? Or is it just like a guesstimate because people maybe were quote unquote more manly at a certain time? <laughs> That's a good question, Mark. I mean, I've been looking at the research. So there was a big data set in Israel because all men in Israel have to enroll in the military um, due to where they are geographically and all the tensions and everything like that. So they have really good data on men because they're running blood work. And so there has been an objective decline in testosterone in men all throughout the world. I mean, this is Brazil, Israel, and as well as here in the UK or in the US, we have the NHANES data set, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, where they also look at blood work. And so we're seeing age matched, an age independent decline in testosterone in all age groups. So between 20 and 30, between 30 and 40, and all that. So it turns out that men in their 20s now have testosterone levels of ordinary men, like, uh, is it Gen Xers? So it's like Gen X, millennial Gen Z, I think. Um, the, the testosterone levels of men in their 20s and 30s is significantly lower, 30 to 40% lower wow. compared to men. It, it, like the, it's, it's akin to men in their 50s just 20 years ago. So something is going on environmentally, you know, and, and so there is good data to show this. Um, I, I personally think it's a combination of a lot of things. Um, the circadian rhythm disruption, which I know we'll get into sleep and all that. But I think the endocrine disrupting chemicals and plastics were just, they're ubiquitous. I mean, it's hard to find water in a glass jar now. I mean, you go to any gas station, you can't buy water in a glass bottle. It's just too expensive to ship now. Um, even things like Topo Chico is delivered. Like we used to get that like in the health space at a keto conference, everyone would get Topo Chico. That was acquired by either Coke or Pepsi. And now it's all in plastic bottles. Mm. And so this stuff is just screwing up our hormones. And all of our parents, you know, now that millennials are having kids, Gen Zers are having kids, um, I just think you're seeing this, what's known as transgenerational epigenetic effects, meaning the lifestyle choices that our parents made is impacting the way that genes are being expressed in the offspring. Mm -hmm. And because plastics and these endocrine disrupting chemicals were not so ubiquitous in the food supply and in our, in our environment 20, 30 years ago, um, we had normal functioning hormones. We didn't have the fertility issues. We didn't have the sperm count declines. So- I mean, I think it's pretty uncommon now for people to have children without the help of in vitro, you know. I mean, in the health, really? very common. I mean, yeah. my, my, I have some friends and family who are not in the health space and like all of their friends who have kids had to do fertility. Uh, people assistance. that are maybe just in their 20s and 30s? Yes. Wow. Super common. And part of it is, you know, these clinics are making a ton of money, but it's, it's become normalized. It's, it's like more common than not. Uh, which is very sad. And I think that's just a reflection of, you know, our environment. I want to know, do you, do you think that, and then kind of what's your opinion on it? 
because you know the plastic stuff, obviously some of that's in your control, but um, not all of it. But the things that are in your control are the time you get to bed, yeah. your your habits, your nutrition, all those things, right? Do you think, or would you say that those would be playing a bigger factor if like most people got the, hab- the, the hang on those? Then, I mean, the plastics are a problem, but it's not as big of an issue. Yeah. You know, it, and Sima, it's a great question. I don't know what's the chicken or the egg or what's moving the levers more so. I do think that the circadian rhythm disruption is huge, mm-hmm. you know, because if you look at how people are, are their habits around phone use, especially in the bedroom, it's it's really problematic. And, and Stanford University actually did a recent uh, study. You know, a lot of people are, are like, yeah, I'm off the computer two hours before bed. I think it's pretty common or wearing blue light filtering glasses. But many people utilize their phones for their alarm clock. And it's just natural to be like, oh, I'm going to set my alarm. Okay, I'm going to check in on Instagram. Oh, I'm going to check my email. And because the phones are so small, they're emitting such a powerful amount of blue light. And it's, it's not just the blue light, but the light intensity. Mm. And that is affecting melatonin, adenosine, all these hormones and signaling molecules that feed into the circadian clock system. And so I do think it's it's multifactorial. You know, we can't just look at the plastics. It's everything. Um, even turning off the Wi-Fi at night, you know, just like doing these small things. There's cell towers. There's these street lights. I mean, you know, life is tough if you live in a city now. If I can advise people to do one thing, it's just try to get the phone away from your head. Yeah. You know, just even if you could put the phone down by your feet somewhere, <laughs> down by the foot of your bed would be a good, I mean, I don't know. What if 10 years, 20 years from now we find out, oh yeah, look at how many brain tumors it caused. It's mm-hmm. like, it's just an easy enough habit to just sl- to move it away that I think that, Anyone can do that. And if you still, you know, you want to use the alarm or whatever, it could just be on the other side of the room. It's going to actually wake you up better. You're going to have to get up to shut it off. So uh, that would be my advice for people. Do you think it's that dangerous? I do. I think especially before bed, for sure. During the day, probably not that big of a deal. I try not to carry it in my pocket around my genitals and, and things like that. And there's been some good research around that too, at lowering testosterone levels and so forth, right? Well, that, and then there's also good research in women using breast thermography. A lot of women now put their phone in their sports bra. Mm. And so there's actually imaging studies of the shape of a phone and abnormal cells within the breast tissue in women. Because it turns out that breast tissue is highly sensitive to all these different factors. And we're seeing breast cancer on the rise in 20-somethings and 30-somethings. Is that a phone in your pocket? Are you just happy to see me? (laughs) No, I mean, this this is real stuff. So- I think we just all need tools. We first of all need to be aware of this stuff, you know. And one of the tools I use, I got this Garmin Tactics watch, and so I, this is my alarm clock. So I just put Ariana Huffington wrote a book, I think in 2014 about sleep. I can't remember the name, but she had a good routine in her family of putting the phones to bed. People talk about like put your kitchen to bed, put all the dishes in the dishwasher, leave it clean. It's kind of like making your bed in the morning and just putting your phone in a drawer. That's what I do. So because it's so tempting. It's designed to be used, right? This is how Instagram and everything makes their money is like just that random dopamine hit. So getting a watch or doing something else, you know, for my daughter, we just have a battery operated alarm for her, you know, so she doesn't have any distractions. Um, So just, you know, like people say, planning to fail is, failing to plan is planning to fail. Mm -hmm. And so you're planning to fail if you have this highly addictive device that is, you know, not at odds, that is at odds with health right at your bedside table. So I think that's one thing. Um, You know, getting a headlamp, like reading in bed, instead of using these compact fluorescent bulbs, utilizing a headlamp with a a red light. That's what I use. There's a company called Petzl. They make these things for hiking. You can buy them at REI for like 20 bucks. So utilizing that. How do you spell it? uh, P-E-T-Z-E-L. I have one in my bag. Actually, I travel with it. Because, you know, you go to a hotel, you turn on the light, it's all these big (laughs) fluorescent. It's like crazy, you know? Is it all plastics? And I, I asked that because, again, with my son, he's three years old. It's like I can't give him like a glass bottle. Um, and then overall, just like we were walking through uh, Costco and sometimes it's like, oh, what are we going to do for dinner? for dinner? It's like, oh, let's just grab a rotisserie. And I had always thought about it. I'm like, oh, it's in this like plastic thing. Yeah. I wonder if that plastic's okay. Maybe it is. Maybe it's not. They switched it over to a bag now. It's just in a hot bag and it they, on the bag it'll tell you reheat inside this bag and I'm like oh this is terrible like we can't get that anymore so I'm curious like is it literally like every piece of plastic that we yeah, come across in life is causing a lot of this disruption Andrew great question it's more the soft plastic so there's they they 
There's PET, polyethylene something, and then there's the HDPE, like supplement bottles. It's a harder, denser plastic. So it's unlikely to leach into your food. Um, so it's the softer plastics, actually the ones like you mentioned, like something that would be wrapped. And I think the combination of heat and plastic is problematic. And so trying to avoid, you know, when you go to the uh, coffee shop, instead of getting stuff in a coffee cup, because the thin part of the coffee, the, the slick, slick part of coffee cups will release some of these microplastics. Mm. And UCLA did this research recently. It's like hundreds of thousands of microplastic particles are coming off in just a cup of coffee, right? So it's I think- like just, a credit card a week or something like that, right? It's <laughs> insane. That's what they said here, like we're ingesting in yeah. plastic. It's hard to avoid. Um, I try to avoid it by, you know, heating stuff up differently than always just using the microwave or, uh, you know, if I am going to use the microwave, just not heating, you know, reheating something in plastic. Yeah. But I don't know what I'm avoiding or not avoiding because like who knows about the ceramic that I'm using? Who knows about the paint that's on there? There's a lot of things to think about. And even with our cooking where, you know, if you were just to throw it in a pot or something, uh, there's a lot of non-stick stuff uh, on there that's probably not great for us. I know there are companies now that are making, you know, frying pans that are a little bit better. I think uh, I got one from, uh, I can't forget the name like of the it. The Green Pan, there's Something one. Something House or Home or Our our Home or Our House, Our, our Place it's called. Mm -hmm. That's what the name of it is. And uh, they, they have kind of regular nonstick, but then they also made one that's like healthier, but I don't really know. Well, I mean, Around that, I mean, I use stainless steel or a cast iron skillet. I mean, they they take longer to clean, but I think the the trade off is is better there. But I think you know one last thing about plastic, you know, because I know this can get boring for people. But a, a study was just published in the New England Journal of Medicine in March of this year, finding that microplastics are found in in arterial plaque. So we've been looking at cholesterol, my, monomaniacally focusing on lowering LDL cholesterol because supposedly it drives heart disease. But it turns out when you biopsy plaque, it's loaded with microplastic. And the people that had the highest concentration of microplastic in their carotid artery plaque had the highest odds of dying, having strokes, heart attacks, and all that. So, you know, we hear about beta amyloid protein aggregation in the brain and dementia and Alzheimer's. What if that's just microplastic being deposited? You know, because all the foods that these people are eating, we've, we've talked a lot about, and Max Lugavere has a great documentary about this. You know, a lot of folks have talked about how, uh, you know, dementia and Alzheimer's is a metabolic disease. But those very foods that cause metabolic dysfunction, it turns out, are enriched in microplastics. I mean, think about these things, Twinkies, donuts, Oreo cookies, they're all delivered in plastic. And all the processed foods, not only do they have sugar, seed oils and this, and food colorings and whatever else, they have microplastic as well. So, I think it's just something to be aware of, you know. And you could maybe speculate if you're a healthier person, maybe you'll get rid of some of these toxic things easier. Yeah, no, totally. Well, that's why exercise is so good because you're sweating. You know, there was a study, uh, Stefan Jenis in Alberta, Canada has done, done multiple studies called the BUS study, blood, urine, sweat. And he's trying to look at how we excrete all these things, chemicals, pesticides, plastics, and heat and exercise are the two best ways. So going and doing, for example, hot yoga, and he's biopsied the sweat, arsenic, lead, cadmium, mercury, atrazine, all the bad stuff that's in our water and our food comes out via sweat. And so you look at people who are really overweight, part of the obesity is a, a contamination theory. There, you know, there's, there's calories, there's gut microbiome, there's all this, but it turns out that fat tissue sequesters these chemicals as well. And so the more that we can exercise and move on a regular basis, these pathways open up. And there's obviously the sauna, which is like an inexpensive way of sweating. Yes. Right? So so as far as the sauna is concerned, because you, you've you talked a lot about that on your YouTube channel, um, what are the benefits that maybe people aren't paying attention to there? Well, I think the number one benefit is reducing blood pressure. You know, we talk a lot about uh, cardiovascular disease. It's the number one cause of mortality. 630,000 Americans die every year from heart disease. Like all throughout covid uh, heart disease was not only the number one risk factor for death from COVID, but there was twice as many deaths from heart disease than COVID, for example. So reducing blood pressure is the number one thing. Um, and just for athletic folks listening, you're improving your circ circulatory system. So you're mimicking exercise without having to exercise. Your muscles are moving and contracting. You're moving blood around, increasing capillary density. So I think that's uh, a really good aspect of it. Uh, it improves blood sugar health as well. So this was going back 1992, the New England Journal of Medicine found that 
insulin-dependent diabetics when they went in hot tubs. And so any heat is good because people are like, hey, I don't like the sauna. Mm -hmm. So if you like a hot, go in the hot tub. Like if you like hot yoga, any heat will help do this. The diabetics required less insulin because they were just going in the hot tub a couple of days a week. And so this has been known for almost you know 35 years now. Uh, so I think that's important. And then just the relaxation aspect is really important. You know, so much of our problems are due to stress, inability to properly relax. When you get hot, you really you know feel much better. You sleep so much better. So I think that's important. You know, I am curious about this though because when Thomas uh, Delio came on the show and, and Dom came on the show, they were mentioning something. Or Thomas was more so mentioning an aspect of the sauna cooking your brain, and he rather hot tub. And I'm wondering like. I mean, our bodies do certain things so that we don't just cook from the inside. So is there any legitimacy to that? Or, I mean, do you believe there's legitimacy to that? To cooking the brain? Um, I don't think so. But I, so my sauna, your brother Chris went in it. We got it up to 220 degrees Fahrenheit. So I, I want to get it really hot because yeah. we're filming this documentary on longevity and stuff. Because um, part of what makes sauna really cool is these heat shock proteins get activated. And heat shock proteins get, uh, they help clean up deranged cellular debris and protein aggregation and so forth. If you think about in the extreme scenario, Parkinson's disease, mm. all these deranged proteins build up in our nervous system so we can't really function, right? Um, and so as we get older, the ability to break down these proteins declines. And when we get hot, our, the heat shock proteins increase and they help clean up our cellular protein levels, right? So um, I think the heat has all these benefits there, but with regards to the brain, we if it was cooking the brain, we wouldn't see research coming out of Finland. This is Yari Laukaman has done this research, looking at just epidemiological studies, people who sauna in Finland more than five days per week reduced their risk of Alzheimer's and dementia 63%. So if it was causing harmful effects to the brain, we would probably by now see that in these epidemiological studies, which we don't see. They've been doing that for decades. <laughs> A long Centuries. time. Centuries. Yeah. Babies in Finland and also in Scandinavian countries are born in the sauna. Dead bodies are cleaned in the sauna. I and mean, this is like a social, on a Friday night, you know, in, in, you know, Eastern Europe and things, people go drink beer and hang out in the sauna. And this is what people do, you know, because it's cold as hell and it's dark. And so I don't know. I found it to be so fun socially, just have people come over in the sauna, do contrast. And people will text me the next day, like, I haven't slept that hard in years, you know. Um, so one way, if people are worried about this, cause it can supposedly cause hair loss as well. Cause the heat can damage your hair. I wear, <laughs> <laughs> <'Cause it fuck. laughs> yeah, I mean, whatever <laughs> you can wear a wool sauna hat. And so you can buy these on Amazon. So that's what I recommend yeah. to guests. And we have this little goofy sauna hat. Oh, yeah. And so that can help cool the, your brain so that you can stay in longer. Mm. Do so. you think it has to do with, uh, like change of temperature? Cause it sounds like. We had Thomas Seeger on the podcast and he was, he talks a lot about cold plunge stuff. And he talks about the impact on glucose, uh, even just being in a cold room, a room that's 60 degrees. People did it for like 10 days. There was a study that was, that was done. Um, do you, do you think it has to do with the body trying to get back to a certain temperature rather than whether we're in the heat or the cold? Cause it seems like they're both really beneficial, but it seems like the main benefit is when you get out. Agree. So I think this idea of thermal stress is just improving our resilience. And so if you think about people that are sick and frail, they, they can't, they're not resilient. They can't walk. They can't be in the heat. They can't be too cold. They're very controlled in terms of what they can tolerate. So getting, you know, environmental extremes on both end of the spectrum, really cold and really hot, just improve our resilience. And so people talk about our parasympathetic nervous system, that calm rest and digest aspect, you know, when we uh, meditate, when we do yoga, we increase our HRV, our heart rate variability. So when we're in the sauna or we get cold, we just improve our body's ability to tolerate stress. And I think that's probably one of the main, one of the main benefits. Oh, we got a little uh, cold plunge video right there. Is that the hat that you're talking about? Yeah, that's the wool <laughs> sauna hat. Um, I have that one too. Nice. Except in gray. There you go. Yeah, it's fun. Actually, that garnered the most comments on that video. People are like, what's up with the hat? I'm like, well, this is what people in Finland and, you know, uh, I thought it was like a non native EMF hat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm crazy, but not that crazy. Yeah, Mark. you're not, you're not the tin hat level quite yet. <laughs> yeah. But you're getting there. <laughs> you're right. Right. So, yeah, I think just the, res excuse me, the resilience is key. And mm -hmm. so we got to think about this like exercise as well. So, exercise, it's stressful. Like, if you were to look at exercise and not know what people are doing, you're like, your blood pressure goes up, your glucose goes up you look like you're stressed out. It's that transient stress that is adaptive. It, you know, if you chronically exercise every day, that would be, you know, if you, 
say did a hundred mile run every day, mm -hmm. that would be too much stress. Wow. Just like too much perceived stress is problematic. A little bit of stress is good. And I think a little bit of cold and heat stress is beneficial as well. Yeah, I think you have, at least from what I've seen, some of the most reasonable information when it comes to like cholesterol and heart disease, uh, statins and so forth. And I was really shocked when you had, you were interviewing a guy on your show. What was the name again? Uh, Phil Ovedia. He's a heart surgeon. When you were interviewing him, I was shocked to hear the efficacy of statins. He basically said they work somewhere between one to 4%. That's crazy. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I was like, that there's, I was like, there's just no way that's even possible. Right. And probably how they're working has no effect on, it's independent of their effect on cholesterol. Statins, it turns out, um, have anti-inflammatory properties. And so um, that might be pro how they're affecting people. Because most people that have heart disease have some degree of background chronic inflammation. And so it's not to say that statins are completely useless. They might offer anti-inflammatory benefits, but there are so many different ways to reduce inflammation that, are, that don't have the downsides. Because it, Turns out when you completely block the isoprenoid uh, pathway and this cholesterol, there's all these um, different molecules that, that statins block. They block an enzyme called HMG-CoA reductase. And off that metabolic pathway, we have coenzyme Q10. That's so important. We have all these um, favorable molecules that aren't being produced when we completely hamper that enzymatic pathway. And this is why football players, even though some of them have high risk, like linemen, for example, because they're really big, eat a lot of calories, they generally don't take statins because it affects their sports performance in a negative way. Um, statins are notorious for changing glucose parameters in a negative way and increasing your risk for diabetes. So there are so many different ways that we can reduce inflammation without completely hamstringing our ability to make cholesterol because every single cell in our body has cholesterol. We need cholesterol. We talked about DHA. Um, part of how DHA and cortisol and testosterone, estrogen are made is from cholesterol. And so we start to see these negative effects. And, but going back to cholesterol, you know, it, it seems that the medical community has been monomaniacally focused on reducing LDL, so-called bad cholesterol for years. But if you actually look at the studies, only 25% of people who end up in the emergency room from an infarct or a heart attack have high cholesterol, meaning 75% of them either have normal healthy cholesterol or low cholesterol. So if it was the sine qua non, the de facto cause of premature death from heart disease, we would across the board see high LDL cholesterol correlating very tightly with death from heart disease, and we don't. And so what's cool is we now are seeing tons of research coming out, finding that, you know what, it's actually more the ratio of total cholesterol to HDL cholesterol, meaning you can have high total cholesterol as long as your high, as long as your HDL, so-called the reverse healthy cholesterol, reverse cholesterol transport is high, then the risk may not be there in terms of for heart disease. But even further, there was a really interesting study somewhere, I think it was the UK or somewhere in Europe, looking at people at the age of 60, tracking them to their 100th birthday. So it's like a 35, 40 year study. It turns out that people at 60 that had higher levels of LDL, the so-called bad cholesterol, were more likely to reach 100 years of age to become a centenarian. And this is data that you don't hear about when, you're, when you, your grandparents or your parents go to the doctor. They're told, Sadly, you got to drive down. We got to give you a statin. And so I think the conversation is much more nuanced. You know, in fact, the only subset of the population for which lowering LDL cholesterol might reduce cardiovascular disease risk is like our age group, like middle-aged men. Outside of that, for women of any age, LDL cholesterol has never been shown to be a risk factor. And for men over the age of 60, higher LDL cholesterol is linked with lower odds of dementia, Alzheimer's, as well as sudden cardiac death and all-cause mortality. So it's cool now that we're seeing these longitudinal studies and getting people to, to rethink this and to focus more on other parameters. Because if LDL is high, uh, what is often also high as well is triglycerides. And triglycerides are really a de facto marker of poor metabolic health. You know, most people um, can have high LDL cholesterol, but be very lean and have good uh, cardiovascular health. But it's very uncommon to see someone with high triglycerides that are cardiometabolically healthy. Mm -hmm. Most people that I worked with in the clinic with a medical doctor, visceral adiposity, big neck, sleep apnea, insulin resistance, their triglycerides were like 300 or sometimes even a thousand. Like their blood is just full of fat and is problem. And they have an inability to really oxidize or burn fat. So I think you know, we really should be focusing on cholesterol in context. I'm not to, it's not to say, and Phil Ovedi even said this, you know, um, we shouldn't just rule out the fact that it, it's not that LDL is useless, but we need to look at the constellation. 
what is the LDL cholesterol levels in relation to HDL, in relation to triglycerides, in relation to blood glucose, insulin, and liver enzymes? And so it's looking at this in a constellation. And the problem is mainstream medical doctors have 15 minutes or less with a patient. So they just need quick in and out rudimentary um, ways of looking at it because they have to go you know, do insurance billing, deal with Medicare, do so much extensive documentation. So um, I think part that's part of the problem. The other part of the issue is we don't really have, there's not a prescription to increase HDL or reduce triglycerides, but we have a tool, statins, that really are good at lowering LDL. And so that's why it's been pushed from the medical establishment because the way that you increase HDL, which is good, and the way you lower triglycerides is with diet and lifestyle change. And you know that's hard if you only have five, 15 minutes with a patient to be like, okay, Sally, you got to walk 8,000 steps. You got to do, you know, so that's kind of where we're at with that. Yeah, and sometimes the doctor's dealing with someone that's never even bothered to read a food label yet, right? Right. What you got over there, Andrew? So um, every time I get my labs done, the cholesterol markers always get the red flag, like, hey, this is way too high. Um, through various conversations on this podcast, whether it be a, a carnivore or just somebody like in the, um, I'll, I'll say alt health space where it's like, oh, high cholesterol is fine. If you look at the, uh, the death rates, it's always the low cholesterol even though it just seems like, well, these people are just dying, so everything's down. But when it comes to dietary cholesterol, yes. especially for someone like me, and I'll, I'll get a little bit further into my background with that, um, when do when should I start paying attention to dietary cholesterol? If my cholesterol is high and uh, let's say I'm an average person that I just went to my, my regular doctor and he's like, your cholesterol is way too high. You need to start eating uns- more, uh, less saturated fat, more unsaturated fat and that sort of thing because we need to lower your cholesterol. Yeah, this is so common. It turns out that there's really no correlation with dietary cholesterol and serum cholesterol. And so these st- studies go back to animal model studies with uh, rabbits actually. And rabbits, as you might know, they eat grass, they're herbivores. So they were giving rabbits eggs, which rabbits don't eat eggs. And they were seeing, and they, so eggs are high in cholesterol. Mm-hmm. Right, And so from those animal model studies, we've extrapolated that, oh, well, dietary cholesterol must increase serum cholesterol. Serum cholesterol is linked with heart disease. So therefore we should reduce dietary cholesterol. But there's not really good at, at human evidence. Uh, Mark and I were talking this morning. There was a recently published study in, in I wanna say it was Mar- uh, May of, of 2023, and I can link it in the show notes, that looked at all the different dietary studies, feeding studies, and looked at which food groups impact serum cholesterol. It turns out coffee, green tea actually increased cholesterol. So these are foods that don't even have cholesterol. And so because most of our serum cholesterol is made endogenously by our liver and our gastrointestinal tract. And so the foods that actually increase cholesterol the most are carbohydrate rich foods. So if you wanna increase your cholesterol, you know, you should start eating bread or sorry, if you want to basically have eating a high cholesterol diet is not going to impact your serum cholesterol. But what often happens is when people cut out carbohydrates, there is a global shift in the proportion of fat to glucose oxidation, and you rely more upon ketone utilization and fat oxidation. So as a function of that, your serum cholesterol will increase and your glucose will go down. And so you see that you see this in the lean mass hyper responder phenotype which is characterized by high LDL cholesterol, high HDL cholesterol, low triglycerides. And so for people that are concerned about their cholesterol, I would advise them to Google more about this lean mass hyperresponder phenotype, which I've talked about a lot on my channel. Dave Feldman has talked about this. Nick Norwitz over at Harvard has talked a lot about this recently. Um, That phenotype is not at higher risk of developing heart disease or causing arterial plaque development. So um, I, I generally tell people, don't worry about dietary cholesterol. A constant thing that's been beneficial for all of our health has been intaking enough protein, but also intaking quality protein. And that's why we've been partnering with Good Life Proteins for years now. Good Life not only sells Piedmontese beef, which is our favorite beef, and the main reason why it's our favorite is because they have cuts of meat that have higher fat content, like their ribeyes and their chuck eyes, but they also have cuts of meat like their flat iron. Andrew, what's the macros on the flat iron? Yeah, dude. So the flat iron has 23 grams of protein, only two grams of fat, but check this out. Their grass-fed sirloin essentially has no fat and 27 grams of protein. There we go. So whether you're dieting and you want lower fat cuts or higher fat cuts, 
that's there. But you can also get yourself chicken, you can get yourself fish, you can get yourself scallops, you can get yourself all types of different meats. And I really suggest going to Good Life and venturing in and maybe playing around with your proteins. I mean, going back to the red meat, there's pecania. All kinds there's of stuff. chorizo sausage, there's maple bacon. My that stuff's goodness. incredible. The maple bacon is yes, so good. Yes, maple bacon is really good. Yo, my girl put those in these uh, bell peppers with uh, a steak oh, and chicken. Yes. And oh my God, it was so good. But either way, guys, protein is essential. And the Good Life is the place where you can get all of your high quality proteins. So Andrew, how can they get it? Yes, you can head over to goodlifeproteins.com and enter promo code POWERPROJECT to save 20% off your entire order. Links in the description as well as the podcast show notes. Saturated fat is a little bit different story though. Correct. So saturated fat can, I mean, it depends on the context, but again, the whole, there's not a lot of good data to link saturated fat with heart disease. The mainstream medical establishment has tried to do that for the past 60 years. I mean, look at what's happened over the past 60 years. Obesity rates are now 75, 70% with overweight bundled in there. Childhood obesity. We've been pushing the low saturated fat you know, uh, way of eating for a long time, and our health has gone in the wrong direction as a collective. So um, Nina Teicholtz has done a lot of good work on this. Um, there's a lot of recently published studies that have looked at this. Um, so yeah, I'm not a huge, I'm not generally... If someone hasn't had a heart attack, uh, a low saturated fat diet is not linked with increased risk of heart disease. And, and you can go to the bank on this. Um, what, what is interesting though, is you're seeing a big push from the medical establishment to push people towards a plant-based diet. Stanford University recently ran that twin study. Uh, Harvard recently ran a study uh, looking at plant-based diets and they purportedly uh, lower the odds of diabetes in these things. But um, they're, again, their biomarker that they're using is LDL cholesterol. <laughs> So it's like, they're not looking at body composition changes, fat mass changes, triglyceride reduction. They're just looking at this one biomarker that we just talked about is not directly tethered to higher rates of cardiovascular disease. So I think it's just important that people, it's very nuanced, you know, but getting back to Andrew's point, I would not be concerned about eggs and this because how cholesterol, again, serum cholesterol is, it's because your liver is making the cholesterol. It's not from diet. The absorption of cholesterol is really, really poor. And then does, and I'm going to use hereditary with an asterisk. Um, Mark and I were talking about this yesterday. So my my dad, um, triple heart bypass surgery. The doctor said that he just had extremely high cholesterol and he had three clogged arteries. So again, triple heart bypass. Um, so because it is that close to me in the uh, like bloodline, right. is do I have to consider anything else? And the asterisk is there because so my dad's never been overweight he was always fairly active until he got into about his 50s you know he stopped playing sports in in his 40s and he stopped playing like racquetball and squash and all that like in his 50s so he was at that point just would go to work and be on his feet all day but never changed his diet you know he was um he's still to this day he'll still drink beer and stuff and so this is all stuff that i don't do i don't drink i don't eat sweets the way he did you know i don't it's very opposite of what i'm the current lifestyle that i live so that's why there's an asterisk next to hereditary because uh, you know again i'm living a different life but he's my dad yeah and so like i was told that like hey that's something you now have to consider because it it i guess it is hereditary so with that in mind do I have to consider anything else when it comes to, you know, what this conversation we're having right now? Mm, this is a beautiful question. There are other things. So what I would look at for you, Andrew, specifically is blood viscosity markers as well. Um, so I would look at your fibrinogen. Mm -hmm. So in, in individuals who have first degree relatives that have had a cardiovascular event, there is a high correlation with elevated levels of blood viscosity or clotting biomarkers. Fibrinogen is one of them. Iron is another, ferritin is another one. So I would look at those markers as well in context of your lipids. So it's not to say that cholesterol and its associations with cardiovascular health didn't play a role at all in your father, but I would argue that there were other factors at play here. Like you mentioned, maybe increased risk of, uh, what, what was his blood pressure? What were the metabolic parameters? What were his liver enzymes? So I think all those factors need to be considered. So also too, sometimes when somebody is administered uh, medication, so if your dad ever took medications for 
uh, you know, said high cholesterol, it can negatively impact his uh, insulin sensitivity. Mm -hmm. Or if he was given uh, diuretics for high blood pressure, it can negatively impact his insulin sensitivity, which would actually uh, speed up this entire process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, he, he wasn't, cause it was one of those things where like one day he's just like, yeah, my left arm will just get cold and numb one day. And I'm like, you should probably go get that checked out because I, I think you might be having a heart attack jokingly saying that. And turns out he, he kind of was. And so that was, yeah, that was really strange. And yeah, my, my blood viscosity is through the roof. I, I have very thick blood. It's that's always another one of those markers. That's like, you know, you need to pay attention to this or whatever. I think um, that's, but that's been like that forever. Mm. You know, I think it comes from snoring, to be honest. Like <laughs> before ever taking anything, it was always thick. So again, this is just more stuff that like, it, it just makes, it forces me to think about all of this because like before it's like, no, I'll listen to a carnivore and be like, yeah, LDL and all this stuff, like we're fine. But then it's like, well, wait a second. There's some other things I should be paying attention to. Yeah. And so again, those other things, um, the fibrinogen would be really good. Looking at the ApoB to A1 ratio, and so apolipoprotein B is a much more objective way to look at all of your atherogenic lipoproteins. So it's not just LDL cholesterol, there's remnant lipoproteins, there's VLDL, and these are very affordable tests. You know, the ApoB to A1 ratio costs between 11 and $17. And this is not, you don't have to go to any esoteric boutique labs. And then in your case, looking at your iron, your ferritin, your hematocrit and hemoglobin. Um, and I think we we talked about this a couple of years ago, maybe donating blood once or mm -hmm. twice a year. And it, it turns out that athletic men tend to run higher in markers of blood viscosity. And so this is a tool, donating blood is good for humanity, it's good for your health, especially if you're a male that tends to have sleep disorder breathing, thicker neck, snoring at night, um, higher testosterone, all that um, can be very beneficial donating blood uh, to reduce the, the viscosity, the viscousness of the blood. And so, you know, the part of the reason why uh, cholesterol has been associated with heart disease is because in arterial plaque, you do see cholesterol deposition. But part of the reason why it's there is the repair process. And so you might say, well, what was the initial insult or damage to the vessel? It could be just thick, viscous blood. Mm -hmm. And so blood is what's known as a non-Newtonian fluid. And it, there's all these different dynamics and changes within blood. And so if we have thick blood from iron overload, sedentary activity, if we have sleep apnea or sleep disorder breathing, then we could have, we could be inducing atherosclerosis and, and it could be independent of our cholesterol. The cholesterol is sort of like the smoke, not really the fire. The fire could be the damage from thick, viscous blood. If you get blood work done, is there any markers that would let you know if you have that? Or is that something that you're just going to have to get told by your doc? Well, here's the thing, Encima. Doctors don't really talk about this as much, mm. uh, the blood viscosity element. There was a test, Jonathan Wright and uh, Ralph Holzwitz put out this test in like 2006. I don't think it ever took off. But basically, I have a free cheat sheet on my website. I'm not trying to promote or sell anything, but I, I, this is really important because I think it can save lives. So on my blood work cheat sheet, I have the parameters for blood viscosity and I put out a bunch of videos on this. So this is not just some esoteric thing. Um, you know, people can look at this. And again, the, the cluster of biomarkers that people want to just hit the replay button, we're talking hemoglobin, hematocrit, RDW, uh, iron, ferritin. And so- What's uh, RDW? Uh, red blood cell width. And then you have your hemoglobin, um, for most men, their hemoglobin's like 16, 15.5, something like that. Um, for men that are on HRT or athletes, sometimes it can run 17, 18, which is quite high. And then our, our hematocrit, uh, you know, in the Tour de France, this is how they would figure out, you know, if people are blood doping or not. And so the idea would be you would donate some blood in the bag. And then before the tour, you'd reinfuse your own blood. But if your he hematocrit goes over 50%, um, that will increase your risk of having a stroke. And so for a lot of people that aren't living at altitude, their hematocrit shouldn't be close to 15, 50%. I mean, unless you're like a ultra and distance, ultra distance runner, the risk to reward benefit for having a high hematocrit uh, doesn't really make a lot of sense. So people should donate blood. So all of us here can function athletically at a high level with a hematocrit at like 42%. Um, so if your hematocrit is high, it could be simple dehydration, but it usually is from iron overload. Yeah, it was super interesting in the uh, Armstrong lie, the documentary done on uh, Lance Armstrong. They talked about him, you know, doing his hardest workout on the hill uh, as he's prepping for Tour de France, and then they would they would save that blood mm -hmm. on his hardest training day where he had the greatest output and so forth. They would save that blood and put it back into him for the race. So just mm -hmm. super interesting. It's fascinating. And in that context, in a very aerobic-based situation where you're training for 21 days as the tour, right? 
that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, you have more red blood cells to carry oxygen and deliver carbon dioxide, you know, during exercise. But the risks there are increased risk of having a stroke. You know, some of these guys that race in the tour, if they have they stroke out or they have a heart. Yeah, some heart some have died, yeah. You know, because their blood is so thick, right? So um, yeah, you're playing with fire a little bit with that. But you know, again, blood donation is super easy. I do it once a year. You know, um, now for menstruating women and uh, former vegans, they really should have more iron in the diet. A lot of women, um, you know, you hear about fatigue, chronic fatigue syndrome, long COVID. A lot of that is just anemia. So women generally trend towards the opposite direction. Cast iron pan, some red meat, right? And you're good. And good gut health. A lot of women who have been eating a vegan diet, they have villus atrophy or they have gluten sensitivity mm. and they have chronic anemia and they don't know why. And, and usually it's from, you know, just they're unable to absorb iron. So it turns out that your small intestine has all these different receptors for absorbing these minerals, iron being one of them. The, the proportion, if you think about your intestine, it's like 18 feet long. It's like an inch, the receptor for iron. So it's, if you have gut inflammation, you're eating Skittles and Pop-Tarts and junk, you're not going to be absorbing a lot of iron. So that's where Whole Foods really. I do want to know, going back to the vegan thing, yeah. you know, the Stanford Twin study, we, we all saw that documentary on Netflix. And, you know, I was wondering if there were Anything that you think people should pay attention to from there? Because one thing I noticed just watching the doc casually was that they always put the twin that was in slightly better shape on a vegan diet. And I was like, nah, that can't be. Then you go back to the twins and it's always the twin that weighs it a little bit less, has better markers. That twin is initially put on the vegan diet. Then the other twin that's a little bit more unhealthy is put on the, uh, the omnivorous diet. Was there anything else you noticed with that study that that, that people should probably try to tune into? That was curious. Yeah, that was an interesting <laughs> study. I mean, part of, just backing up, I'll address your question, but mm -hmm. Chris Gardner, who was a lead researcher on that study, um, several years ago, he did this diet fit study as well at Stanford. And they wanted to look at the, the genetic expression changes on a vegan versus keto diet. And they had every opportunity to look at body composition and they looked at body mass index and, and body fat percentage and all this at the start of the study, but they failed to do so at the end. And I sent him an email and he wrote back and said something sort of like, oh, we, yeah, we should have looked at body composition changes, but we didn't. I'm like, well, you looked at genetic analysis. You did all this stuff. Why not just look at uh, bioimpedance? I mean, this is really low cost stuff. And so it seems that there's an agenda here with that because he actually receives a lot of money from Beyond Meat an impossible uh, burger. Uh, so this is the thing, there's so much uh, conflicts of interest in the research community because there's a lot of money to be made. There's a lot of investors that want, that people, billionaires and, and multimillionaires that want to invest in, in novel products and novel food products such as impossible burger or meatless or dairy-free cheeses. I mean, there, there's big money to be made because the consumers have been told that it's better for the environment, right? So there's a huge, this is the next wave of investment opportunity. So I think there's an agenda there, but going back to what uh, any questionable things th that I saw in that study, they didn't look at body composition changes in that. So I think that would be more telling. They, the sole objective, so it's interesting when you read a study, you want to find out what are the, what's the intent of the study? What are they looking to achieve? They specifically wanted to look at how these different dietary patterns affected LDL cholesterol, right? Because if you go from a carnivore diet to a plant-based diet, your LDL will go down. Mm. But does that mean that your risk of heart disease also goes down? And that's very questionable. They didn't look at body composition. Well, let me, quick question about yeah, the yeah. body composition. On the doc, you, there was uh, the section where they uh, paid attention to their lean body mass on each diet. And sure. they're, so, so is that what you're mentioning? There, it was, there, were they not paying attention to body composition there? Well, there was actually a change in waist circumference in the wrong direction in the plant-based group. Yep. So that to me is, and, and but this is a short-term study, mm -hmm. right? So if you extrapolate that over a year, you know, but if you increase your waist circumference, that would mean that that way of eating is, is not in favor of supporting metabolic health. And then there was an increase in triglycerides in the vegan arm of the study. And that wasn't really talked about. And what I, why is that important? Because we have numerous studies now finding high triglycerides are independently correlated with increased risk of heart disease. And so you have one biomarker that purportedly is linked with heart disease, LDL cholesterol goes down, but then you have another biomarker, you could say two biomarkers that increased waist circumference as well as triglycerides. Why didn't that get media attention? Because I don't know why. I mean, it seems like the media is also really pushing a, a plant-based diet narrative. So I think that's what's interesting. But we, we do have a lot of uh, feeding studies 
And one of them was published by Kevin Hall et al. in 2021. And this was the so-called metabolic ward study where they randomized people to have a animal-based keto diet for two weeks and then have a plant-based diet or the other way around, have a plant-based diet and then an animal-based keto diet. And at the end of the study, the conclusion was a plant-based diet is better for waist circum for all different parameters. But that study, I don't know if you guys have heard about this. This was just like weeks ago, got reanalyzed. It turns out that there was a diet carryover effect. So the order in which the diets were applied in, made one of the, particularly if the individuals did the animal-based keto diet first, it made the plant-based diet look better. In contrast, if individuals did the plant-based diet first, it made the keto diet look worse. So they should have done a washout period. And even Walter Willett, who is as conventional as they come and as, as anti-saturated fat and this and that, he was like, yeah, this study should be retracted because they didn't do a washout period. So what's interesting, knowing that data, then going back to the new Stanford study, it's like, okay, now that we know that there is this diet carryover effect, this sh we should be considering uh, this information. So I think it's interesting because when you go on a whole, uh, sorry, an animal-based keto diet, what happens? Your LDL cholesterol goes up, but your triglycerides, um, metabolic health goes down. And you start to rearrange, you start to change, you know, the, the partitioning of energy that your body and brain are using. And that seems to have a favorable effect, particularly in the context of optimizing brain health, metabolic health, mood, depression, all of that. So uh, this stuff is very interesting. I don't know that we're ever going to get to the bottom of it. I mean, I, I'm in favor of creating a citizen science project where, look, we have enough people who are vested on both sides, plant-based versus keto. We should create an app that's user-generated where people upload their blood work and just track them over time. We're never going to be able to get to the bottom of this by sharing these epidemiological studies or doing these two-week feeding studies, <laughs> you know? But we have enough people that have been doing carnivore or keto or carbohydrate restriction or carb cycling for years and are very, very healthy. And we have people who have been doing a plant-based diet for a long time. And I think the cool part about it is there's something for everyone. For some people, maybe a plant-based diet makes a lot of sense based upon their genetics, their ethnicity, their microbiome. You know, maybe in Andrew's case, maybe a little bit more plant-based might be good based upon his genetic history, right? So I think we should be more customizing this and people, and my position is you should do blood work, see your biomarkers. If they're going in the wrong direction on one way of eating, pivot and see what, you know, improves it. If you're someone that's taking supplements or vitamins or anything to help move the needle in terms of your health, how do you know you really need them? And the reason why I'm asking you, how do you know, is because many people don't know their levels of their testosterone, their vitamin D, all these other labs like their thyroid, and they're taking these supplements to help them function at peak performance. But that's why we've partnered with Merrick Health for such a long time now, because you can get yourself different lab panels like the Power Project panel, which is a comprehensive set of labs to help you figure out what your different levels are. And when you do figure out what your levels are, you'll be able to work with a patient care coordinator that will give you suggestions as far as nutrition optimization, supplementation, or if you're someone who's a candidate and it's necessary, hormonal optimization to help move you in the right direction so you're not playing guesswork with your body. Also, if you've already gotten your lab work done, but you just want to get a checkup, we also have a checkup panel that's made so that you can check up and make sure that everything is moving in the right direction if you've already gotten comprehensive lab work done. This is something super important that I've done for myself. I've had my mom work with Merrick. We've all worked with Merrick just to make sure that we're all moving in the right direction and we're not playing guesswork with our body. Andrew, how can they get it? Yes, that's over at MerrickHealth.com slash Power Project. And at checkout, enter promo code Power Project to save 10% off any one of these panels or any lab on the entire website. Links in the description as well as the podcast show notes. We talked a lot about uh, heart disease and cholesterol and so forth. How important do you think the adjustments to light are in terms of, you know, blue light and uh, getting sunlight and so forth? I, I can't enumerate it, but I think it's huge because it's, you know, it's a core function. When you look at all bodily functions from testosterone increasing, cortisol increasing, all of these are uh, under the control of the circadian clock system. And when we are exposed when we get insufficient amounts of sunlight and or we're exposed to artificial blue light at the wrong time, we are changing the amplitude and the frequency of this, this sine wave known as our circadian rhythm. And so I think it's very, very important, and it's, uh, but it, it's hard to enumerate. 
Uh, one of the reasons why I got, and I'm not promoting this because I, I don't make any money off this, this Garmin watch has a light future. I'll show you, Mark. So it has a solar intensity. Um, mm. It looks at the lux that you get. Oh, that's cool. So it's really neat. Yeah. So you can just wear this and see. Um, and you can get these so-called photometers off Good Amazon. Amazon. It's really cool. And the days that I feel the best are the days that I get the most sunlight, right? Um, working outside, going, I mean, people go on vacation. They're like, why do I feel so good? You know, well, it's most of the times you're outside, you're at the beach, you know, you're at the pool, like you're hiking, you're doing stuff outside. So I think this is really important. There was a few studies. I think Stanford did this study finding that, and I think sex drive is a proxy of, of health and vitality. You know, if you're not, if you have no libido, something's wrong, Right. Um, depending upon your age, of course. But like one study found that when they had people go outside, and these were like couples, um, they were more likely to engage in sexual behavior, right? They didn't do sexual behavior because like the sun helps with testosterone. And people out there fucking each other in the forest, basically. <laughs> right? I mean, <laughs> be careful when you're on your walks. Yeah. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. I, I, it's really important. So you can get a, it's called a Lux meter, L-U-X, when we look, when we want to enumerate light intensity, it's it's in the the units of lux, and so it's good to go around your home and just. A lot of people think like light hygiene, oh, that's like mm. stuff for biohacker nerds. I think we should all be aware of light hygiene. So I have this light meter that I used. Again, it's nineteen bucks on Amazon, and you can just look in your bedroom. And so we want to have less than fifty lux of light in the two hours before bedtime. And humans would not, yeah, something like that. Super simple. That one's twenty four dollars. Have you seen any data um, in terms of uh, like uh, sunlight and or red light therapy in terms of like glucose or in terms of cholesterol? Because I'm thinking like, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I believe uh, the sun interacts with your skin, cholesterol, vitamin D, and so on. So I'm thinking if you don't get outside and you're not getting the sunlight and you're consuming all this cholesterol, um, maybe it doesn't maybe it doesn't end up in the right places, or maybe you're not utilizing your energy as efficiently as you could be. I, I would agree logically with that. I can't like cite any studies that, that I know of, um, but just there was one study and I want to say it was Stanford or somewhere else, um, Mount Sinai uh, did this research, but looking at the, the recommendations for light intensity. So during the day, we should be having a thousand, between 500 and a thousand lux. So if you're working in an office or a place like this, you can bring your light meter and be like, oh, we need to either get outside more or change the lighting or add windows, for example. And then before bed, we should have less than 50 lux. In our room, it should be less than five lux. So, you know, a lot of people in their bedroom, they might not have blackout curtains or they might have these little lights or smoke detectors, whatever. Um, those are things that we should be mitigating for sure. How about, I mean, as far as mitigating light, just a really good sleep mask. What do you think about that? I think it's awesome. I, okay. bring, I bring it when I travel all the time. Gotcha. Yeah. How about in your uh, in your house? Because, you know, you have a daughter. Like, how do you guys help, like, eliminate some of the blue light indoors? Um, because, you know, with my son, like, he, he likes to watch, like, cartoons and stuff. And it's like, okay, that's on. And then as the sun goes down, it's like, shit, like, all right, well, let's get into bed. And he's like, you know, the TV's still on and stuff. And like, yeah. I've, I've converted every light bulb into like a, like an amber light bulb because apparently incandescent is an issue and we can't get them anymore. Yeah, um, and it's, yeah, going to be like banned, which I mean, hey, if that doesn't throw up a red flag for you, like what the hell? No, nothing will. But yeah, for your, for you and your household, like what's some advice and some tips that you can give, uh, you know, other family households uh, on eliminating or minimizing some of this blue light? Yeah, great question, Andrew. So I think what you said, I mean, I have a lot of incandescent light bulbs in, in our house. And so they do, not only is the light intensity lower, but the color hue is different, which has a, a less powerful suppressive effect on adenosine and melatonin uh, release. So that's good. But um, with kids, it turns out that the shape of their eyes is such that they're actually more sensitive to the harmful effects of blue light. So basically, I think it, we need to look at, you know, like we talked about with cholesterol, HDL and LDL, we need to look at sunlight exposure in relation to artificial light exposure. So if your kid is outside a lot during the day, they'll probably have more of a buffer effect of watching an iPad or a TV before bed. But I would get in the habit of just cutting it off an hour before sleep, mm. um, if possible. Now, if it's the summertime, you know, the sun's out, I think we need to look at seasonality here as well. It's harder in the winter because it gets dark early and then what are kids going to do, you know, and things like that. But um, 
you know, we have blue light filtering glasses for my daughter and she wears them sometimes, not all the time. I mean, th these things aren't perfect, but I think just being a little bit more intentional about it, you're going to be way ahead of most people. Um, and so reducing the intensity. And I think a TV is probably better than a, a tablet or, or iPhone um, because it's further away. The intensity is a little bit different, but just be mindful. Try to cut it off an hour before bed. You mentioned uh, something about street lights. Now, uh, you, I think you said you saw a study where they were talking about um, people being a little bit uh, more unhealthy in areas where they inserted street lights. Yeah, I mean, this is incredible. And this data has been conducted, I want to say, since like 2007. I mean, this is not like just in the last five years. It's been going on for 10, 15 years. Um, the new street lights are just like, like we're hearing this big push about banning incandescent light bulbs. It's all going to LED. And I'm not a light expert, but there's something about LED that's more harmful than incandescent. But these street lights are so bright. So in my neighborhood, it used to be very rural and we would take evening walks and like, it was no big deal, you know, without wearing blue light filtering glasses because the street lights, just like incandescent lights, they're orange. The old ones are, are more orange and lower intensity. The new ones are super blue, very bright. It's like you're lighting up a baseball stadium or something, mm -hmm. right? It's insane. <laughs> yeah. And it literally now, it's sort of like, you know, when you haven't had a, a McDonald's cheeseburger or chicken nugget, <laughs> it's so powerful. It just hits you like, whoa, that's intense. You know, when you're mindful about your light and you go under these street lights, it almost hurts your eyes because you're not used to this at that time of the day. So I think it's, you know, municipalities should be mindful of this because it's having a, it's a public health threat at this point. So um, I know it sounds weird, but like, you know, when I go walking at night, like I'll put my hood on you know, just to help with the streetlights. I mean, I still want to get my steps in, but just tr being intentional about not, not looking up at the streetlights um, or taking walks away from the streetlights and things like that. And they flicker, so it's super unnatural, and that's why we get eye strain. Yeah. Yeah. Any idea where this uh, raise in cancer amongst younger people is coming from? You know, this is really interesting, Mark. Um, I mean, there's a lot of high-profile cases now, act actresses and things like that in their 20s and 30s that are getting really aggressive metastatic breast cancer. And so I've been naturally interested in this. And um, there's a, an event called the American Association for Cancer Research. They have an annual seminar. And they just uh, published this data a couple of weeks ago, actually, finding that individuals who are at higher risk of cancer have accelerated rate of biologic aging. So it's been long recognized that cancer is sort of a disease of aging. You know, uh, all men will die with prostate cancer, but not of prostate cancer or from prostate cancer. So we naturally get, you know, deranged cellular metabolism and, and, and increase our risk of cancer over time. But it turns out that if we accelerate our rate of biologic aging from poor lifestyle choices, artificial light exposure, processed food consumption, like we've been talking about, then we're at higher risk of cancer. So it seems that um, these individuals, and, and there's a lot of like TikToks talking about this now, how Gen Zers are aging like milk, not aging very well. And it's probably because of, of phone use, I honestly think in bed, uh, in eating processed food and crap like that. But it seems that higher rates of biologic aging are increasing the rates and the incidence of cancer, particularly of the gastrointestinal tract, so colon cancers, uh, uterine cancers in women and breast cancer, as well as brain cancer. So I mean, I don't know about you guys, but like that would be the most scary diagnosis, getting cancer. And so I think we should all be taking this pretty seriously, you know? Um, and it comes down to the basics, the fundamentals, walking, circadian rhythm, health, sleep hygiene, eating real food. I mean, we're not talking about buying, there's NAD supplement. There's all these crazy supplements. They're very expensive that people are, are spending a lot of money on. I think if you're not doing all the foundations, you shouldn't even go near that stuff. You know, you should really focus on the basics. And now there's ways to test this. So there's a test called True Diagnostics. And they have this algorithm based upon this Dunedin study in New Zealand. Have you guys talked about this before? I don't no. believe so. This is, inc this is like the most fascinating piece of research, I think, out on the internet now. This has been a 40-year study where they tracked individuals, all different biomarkers in New Zealand. They were born in 1972 or something like that. They've been looking at their pace of aging, looking at s how their cells are aging over time. And correlating, you know, what is linked with a better pace of aging, uh, and how is that separate from, yeah, true diagnostics? No financial affiliation with this, but they use the Dunedin pace of aging uh, biomarker. Uh, I've had a few clients that I work with. I do some coaching for executives and CEOs and stuff like that, and um, they often love this test because it's it's amenable to lifestyle change. You know, you can change your diet, your lifestyle. Uh, six months later, look at your pace of aging. And they look at methylation tags on your white blood cells. And it turns out that as we get older, our cellular functions change. And you can enumerate this with the, these methylation tests. 
But it turns out that the very simple way to do this is just ask people, hey, how do you, how old do you think I am? How, how, you know, when people come up to many of us who live this lifestyle, they don't realize that we're in our forties. How old do you think Encima is? I'm going to go late thirties. He's 56. <laughs> Doing pretty good. No, I'm 31. 31? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So 30, yeah. So it's like we can, there's actually tests that, that can look at, at this. Mm. Um, and just how, how we, are, we are aging reflects our biologic age. And I think the most important takeaway from this is our perception of how we're aging. So if, a lot of people will, will say, um, oh, I'm in my 40s. I can't lift weights anymore. Mm. Yeah. It's like, what are you talking about? Yeah. Like, you should be able to do- And well, now's the best time, yeah. Yeah, there was this video on TikTok and it was a woman outside of a bar asking guys how long they last in bed. Like how long? And some guy, he was 41. And he was like, oh, when I was younger, I used to last 20 minutes. But now it's like- I can't even get it up because I'm so old. I'm like, you're 41, dude. What are you talking about? So that's, this is not normal. So the point is we, mindset matters in all these conversations, you know? So how we feel we're aging uh, affects our biologic age. Yeah, I had a guy at jujitsu, um, you know, he was like, kind of looked like he was hurting. They're like, oh, do you all right? And he's just like, oh yeah, you know, just getting old. I'm like, oh shit, how old are you? He was four years younger than me. And so I was a little bit surprised. Um, so right now I actually have, so one cousin, she's in the hospital. She has um, a lot of uh, blood clots throughout her body. So, you know, positive vibes towards her. And then another cousin, it's about similar age, is battling cancer big time. Like she's fighting hard and it's, you know, it's, it's battling cancer. It's not pretty right. when it comes to, um, I'll say cancer. Like I know you just talked about like the, uh, the white blood panels and our white blood cell count and all that stuff. Is there any other markers or tests or anything that somebody can do preemptively to like, to do just to be like, okay, are we good here? You know, like I know my, my habits haven't been good. You know, I'm following traditional stuff. I'm in school all day, I'm, you know, blue light all day long, eating whatever I can because I'm on a tight time schedule. So it's a lot of stuff in a package. Holy shit, maybe I'm doing all these things incorrectly. What can I do to check to make sure there's not like a red flag where it's like, oh my goodness, maybe I need further testing because nobody, at least to my knowledge, is like, hmm, you know, I feel like I have a little bit of cancer. Let me go and check just to make sure. No, it's always something's, something's wrong. Uh, sorry to let you know, but you have this cancer diagnosis now. So yeah. what can people do to just, again, try, it's such a weird thing because nobody wants to get ahead of that. Right. But is there maybe some labs or something that they can do to just be like, okay, let me throw that in with my regular, you know, labs that I hopefully that they're getting once a year. <clears throat> no, great question, Andrew. And just for disclaimer, I'm not an oncologist or cancer specialist, right? So take this with a grain of salt. But I would look at just common metabolic parameters. And again, going back to that American Association for Cancer Research seminar that released this data, they didn't look at esoteric biomarkers. They looked at glucose. They looked at white blood cell counts. So we're looking at basically chronic inflammation and metabolic dysfunction. And if those are in balance, that was linked with higher pace of aging, higher risk of cancer. So I think that is where people should focus on. Um, Books that I would recommend would be Tripping Over the Truth by Travis Christofferson. Really excellent book about the history of cancer and how we've gotten cancer wrong for a lot of years. Um, I think that's a really good book because he weaves in all the aspects of metabolic health as it's related to cancer. Um, so I would consider that and just try to do things to reduce inflammation. So it turns out that chronic inflammation creates the environment to foster cancerous growth. And it's likely that all of us right now have some precancerous cells, but our immune system is able to deal with that noise because we have low levels of inflammation. So if we're bogging down, think about when you have all these windows open on your computer. You know, you might have Microsoft Word open, you might have Adobe Photoshop, your cache is bogged down. So if our, if our immune system is bogged down with all this noise from our diet, from chronic inflammation, it's not going to be able to survey, there's called tumor, uh, tumor surveillance, uh, you know, natural killer cells and so forth that can help kill these precancerous cells. And so I think that's a big part of it, as well as metabolic health. So it turns out that poor metabolic health is linked with higher rates of prostate cancer, colon cancer, uterine cancer and ovarian cancer in women, breast cancer and lung cancer and brain cancer. So these are common cancers that most people suffer from. So if we improve our metabolic health, we're going to produce the odds that we would at least get those cancers. Full body MRI? So I've done that. I think it's cool. It's about 2000 bucks, you know? There's now one in uh, the Bay Area. Pronovo. 
It used to only be in but Canada. But your starting point would be something le way less expensive. Yeah, just doing blood work once a year. I mean, the test that I just mentioned, you can do all this for 150, 200 bucks. It's not a lot. Um, and so if someone does suspect, like Andrew mentioned, first degree relative with heart disease, first degree relative with cancer, then yeah, I think a full body MRI every five years would be good. What else does a full body MRI tell us? Does it tell us anything else? Or is it mainly kind of scanning for tumors or cancer? Is it showing uh, visceral fat or anything like that? Yeah, no. So it's looking at your red bone marrow. It's looking at visceral fat. It's also looking at, yeah, potentially soft tissue cancer. So um, the cool thing about MRI is it's non-invasive. Like you wouldn't want to do a full body CT scan all the time. There's just too much radiation. So the MRI is non-invasive. So it would find brain cancer. It would find testicular cancer, gastrointestinal, like liver cancer, it would find. Um, and then it would also look at your fat mass. And so the MRI is really good to look at visceral fat. Even though it's expensive, finding cancer is critical because you can get treat. You a lot of times uh, it seems like you can get treatment for it if you find it early enough. Early enough, and then you can make the lifestyle changes as well to help increase the efficacy of the treatment. Um, so yeah, the MRI is a good option. You know, um, Peter Atia recommends colonoscopies over forty for people because colon cancer is on the rise. So I think those are really good things. Um, if people want to do a more sort of uh, detecting cancer on a, on a homeboy discount kind of thing. The thermography is good for breast tissue. So this is a way to look at imaging of heat. And it turns out that cancerous cells start to release more heat. And so you can do breast thermography and it's less invasive than a mammogram. So women um, can just Google thermography clinics. They often pop up at like uh, OBGYN centers and naturopathic centers. Like they'll have a thermography once a month on a Saturday and go and pay a hundred bucks and, and do that. You know, if there is a risk of breast cancer, so I, those are things that I would recommend. In general, because um, one thing that we've been talking about a lot recently is there seems to be a lot of pushback in terms of fasting. Nowadays, you see a lot of people talking negatively about it, whereas a few years ago, it was super positive. Um, and some people think about doing fasting when they do think about cancer. So I'm, I'm curious, what are your thoughts uh, on intermittent fasting nowadays? Have any, have any of your ideas changed on it? Um, is there anything people should be paying attention to about it? Yeah, great question. I found when I was doing a lot of excess, like um, prolonged fasting, 36 hours and more, mm -hmm. um, I felt like it was really good for mental clarity and brain health, but I just lost strength and muscle, you know? And, and I've just been convinced through all the data on grip strength that strength really matters. And you guys talk about this all the time. So um, personally, I don't do a lot of excessive fasting, just more early time restricted feeding. So eating really between the hours of eight or it was like 10 and six, 10 a.m. to six. And going back to sleep and circadian rhythm health. Uh, it turns out that not only does light exposure and darkness impact our circadian rhythms, when we eat also entrains the circadian clock. Yeah. And so I think that is really helpful for sleep-wake cycles. Um, but the data on fasting is really great from an anti-inflammatory perspective. Some of the earliest data, uh, or earliest human clinical trials on fasting, were looking at asthma prevalence in overweight people and finding that when overweight people ate what's called ADF, alternate day feeding, so they eat like Monday, fast Tuesday, eat Wednesday, fast Thursday, they had reduction in asthma symptoms and allergy symptoms because it's reducing inflammation. So eating is necessary, but it's also a stress. Like cortisol goes up after a meal. That's when I, all these people on the internet talk about oh, cortisol is bad. You know, you need to do, well, it's like, well, then you shouldn't exercise. You shouldn't eat if you're mm -hmm. really scared of cortisol. Getting out of bed increases cortisol, right? So we need to keep cortisol in context. But anyway, for, you know, painting like a broad brush stroke on fasting recommendations, I think it's good for people who are relatively sedentary. Prolonged fasting can be helpful. Um, and if they have a history of metabolic debt, you know, meaning they've been overweight, insulin resistant, sedentary for a long time, fasting helps, you know, kickstart, um, you know, some of those metabolic pathways. But for people that are trying to be super athletic and, you know, maintain healthy body composition and muscle, muscular strength and mass, uh, excessive fasting, I don't think is very beneficial. With all the information that you've found out, how do you eat? Basically like what we're talking about. Um, so my feeding window is between generally 10 to 6 p.m. That might fluctuate based upon the season or whatever. Um, but mostly carnivore style uh, with avocado, fruit. I love olives, um, raw milk, raw dairy, yogurt, berries. Um, and for vegetables, usually it's fermented vegetables like you know, sauerkraut, you know, things like that. Um, I uh, was traveling in Southeast Asia and, and uh, Korea and things like that. And I couldn't help but notice that Every meal, they're having kimchi before and after. And you talk to these elders and it was a, a medical conference. So there was a lot of doctors who had been doing this for a long time. And 
they're talking about childhood obesity in South Korea is increasing. And I was like, why do you think that is? I mean, there's McDonald's now and stuff. And they're like, well, it's because the parents aren't making kimchi like they used to, like their grandparents did. They're just buying it from the store. It's not the same stuff. And so they were correlating it not only with reduced activity and all that, but just the lack of good bacteria. And I think a lot of people, you know, have poor gut health. They were born via C-section, were given antibiotics, weren't breastfed. And so this idea that we can all tolerate all these vegetables, you know, people's digestive tracts are not really as, their digestion is not really that good. So having vegetables that are fermented is like pre-digested. So those are the veggies that I usually consume. Pre-digested and also very low calorie. Totally. And right. high in good bacteria. Right. Yeah, it's kind of a win-win all around. Yeah. Yeah, I might have to look into that because, you know, the second I say I'm going to start incorporating more vegetables, it's just like an explosion goes off in my stomach. And then it's a really cool excuse for me to be like, all right, I'm good with that. So yeah, you mentioned kimchi. Is there anything else that I can look for in, in regards to like trying to, re, I'll say rebuild um, my gut health? Great question. So a friend of mine, Bill Schindler, have you guys had him on the podcast? He has a book called no. Eat, Eat Like a Human. Really, really good book. It'll be in the show notes and Andrew's looking it up now. Um, he has a fermented potato recipe Ooh, that's really good. So that sounds good. My, um, basically, you can buy these fermentation kits for 29 bucks on Amazon. And all fermentation usually is, is you just mincing, in this case, potatoes up and you put some salt in the brine. You put it in these jars and let it sit for three days and then cook it. And it tastes um, amazing. My daughter loves these, these chips. So we'll take, excuse me, lard or butter or ghee, fry up the fermented potatoes. And it's like potato chips. You know, it tastes phenomenal. Kind of like a, uh, um, it's more of like a, gosh, what's the type of chip? So like salty chips and the ones that you would buy. Salt and vinegar? Salt and, yeah, it's like salt and vinegar type of, mm. type of, and it tastes phenomenal. But it's been broken down, so the oxalates are reduced and things like that. Um, that's in the book? That's in the book, yeah. So the book is all about, so Bill is an anthropologist. And so he's traveled all throughout the world and, and looked at how do humans eat? Like what, what do humans eat in different parts of the world? Like, for example, I think it's in Greenland, they, uh, the people in Greenland figured out that the, they would use, uh, uh, cook, uh, kill sharks and eat them because you know, that was, they don't have like ruminant animals running around, I guess, Greenland. So they would, but the liver is highly nutritious, but unless you ferment it, there's an enzyme in the liver of sharks that would like kill you. Mm. So they figured out that if they bury the liver for 90 days in dirt, and ferment it that they could eat the liver. So we actually, mm, on a trip, he, he brought this fermented shark liver and it would taste Dude. phenomenal. <laughs> so anyway, he, he's really big into this and he draws on principles from Sally Fallon's work. And Sally has done a lot of research on meal preparation, especially in the context for vegan and veg vegetarians. I think this is where a lot of um, plant-based dieters go wrong is they're not properly preparing the grains and the plants that they're eating in a way that reduces the anti-nutrient load. And so I think, you know, just for example, like having rice that's been soaked overnight. So I eat rice, you know, but I soak it overnight in water, a little vinegar or a little apple cider vinegar, and then put it in the slow cooker and you digest it so much better. Hmm. It's probably lower glycemic, right? So yeah, it's supposed to be like uh, almost half the amount of carbohydrate or something like that. I don't know how true that is, but mm -hmm. heating and cooling of those kind of uh, carbohydrates creates a prebiotic, I guess, right? Yeah. So there's just so many things we can do from a food prep strategy strategy that just take a couple minutes to increase the digestibility, you know, of these uh, uh, plant-based foods. So yeah, how about uh, probiotics? Like like a capsule to do all the work for me. So that is that can be good for sure. Um, it really is contingent upon the potency. So when you go to the grocery store, you might have something that's two billion. You're like, whoa, two mm -hmm. billion. <laughs> but you really want like like or, or sorry, the million. So usually probiotics will be like. Uh, 5 million CFUs, colony forming units, but you need like hundreds of millions, if not billions. So um, there's, yeah, I, I would just say the potency really matters, you know, um, getting a strain. And actually probiotics are very strain specific, you know, in terms of like, what are you trying to achieve? People with depression might benefit from say, Lactobacillus plantarum, you know, autistic children benefit from, I think it's uh, animalis, lactobacillus animalis, right? Or ruteii. So it's very specific on what your goals are, whether it's depression, whether it's in the context of metabolic health, there's a probiotic strain called Acromenzia mucinophilia that's really good for metabolic health. It turns out that overweight people tend to have lower proportions of this specific bacteria. And when they supplement it, they improve their metabolic health. So I think this idea that we all need all these bacteria is a little bit old school thinking, um, but just kind of like, oh, take a multivitamin. It's like, well, 
if you're a carnivore, maybe you don't need a multivitamin. Maybe you need like just magnesium, for example. Um, if you're a vegan, maybe you need more iron and B12, right? So just being a little bit more nuanced, I think is beneficial. You said help with depression and probiotics. You don't hear that too often. What are you, uh, what are you alluding to there? Well, so it turns out that our brain and gut have an intimate crosstalk and correlation. And so a lot of us, I mean, think about it when we're sick and we have a tummy ache, we feel kind of depressed, right? So inflammation in the gut triggers by way of microglial cells and these different neuronal receptors, uh, uh, depression in the brain. And so a lot of people that um, are susceptible to anxiety and depression can benefit from supporting gut health. And that's been borne out in the research now quite extensively. Um, It turns out that people that, and this is just People might think I'm biased or cherry picking, but more vegans and vegetarians uh, report increased anxiety and depression. And it probably is due to the fact that a lot of so-called plant-based food is just highly processed. You know, Oreos would be plant-based, right? Mm-hmm. For example, Rice Krispie treats are plant-based. So a lot of people are eating just plant-based junk food and that is causing poor gut health, which is affecting their mood and their memory and focus. Um, so I think it's really important for people to acknowledge that uh, gut health, uh, the health of our gut affects our brain, you know? Uh, there's no way to argue mm-hmm. that at this point. So if it's an inflammatory response, then would like red light or even sunlight be beneficial for a depressed stomach, I'll say? <laughs> yeah, I think that would be beneficial and as well as just mindfully eating. You know, when we think about um, how do we get an imbalanced gut? How do we get all this acid reflux and all this um, slowing down our, our mm-hmm. like, chew, like the act of chewing? Um, scientists have looked at this. We should be chewing about 25 to 40 chews per swallow, oh, man. which is crazy, right? But basically what that means is get off your phone before the meal, you know, sit down. We used to eat in groups, you know, and, mm-hmm. and share stories from learn from our elders and like put the fork down and, and all that. Um, a lot of us are unfortunately eating in isolation. We're on our phones and all that. So I think that's not a good strategy, especially if you have poor gut health. You know, just slowing down, chewing, being mindful, being grateful, talking with your partner, your roommate, your kid. Um, that's really beneficial. So you do a lot of walking. Uh, you told me that you run, you lift. How often do you lift? And is there anything that you're mindful of with lifting? Is there anything you learned maybe in the last couple of years that you figured you would implement into your lifting? Like for us, we've had, uh, we always have something kind of like new cooking up, but uh, it's not really new. It's just stuff that we stumble upon. Like we've been messing around with some sandbags. So has there been anything new that you've kind of run into that's really been helpful or useful? You know, just focusing on the glutes. You know, I used to have low back pain um, from poor form deadlifting and in, in college and stuff like that. So just more like um, I got into Brett Contreras' work and all the glute lab stuff, hip thrusting, hip hinges, um, doing more sled work for my knees. I think that's been helpful. Um, but, I, you know, learning powerlifting, I think was really good. I, I wish I learned powerlifting early on. And then blending that with bodybuilding, I think, for just the periodization aspect of it and, and uh, novelty. Um, yeah, just changing up the sets and reps and not always doing the same thing all the time. And then also, you know, doing a lot of uh, banded pull aparts, you know, following like Matt Winning and some of that. Like he recommends, I think, like 100 sets of reverse uh, flies for delts a week, spread out throughout mm-hmm. the week. So just some of those things. You know, because when you're younger, you can get away with just hitting bench three days a week, you know, and just like having all the, you know, we're naturally more sort of in that hyper cathodic state, like more forward mm-hmm. leaning. So just doing more back work, more pull-ups. Um, and then when I lift now, I just do compound movements. I don't really do screw around with isolation exercises. Periodically, just for biceps or triceps, a little bit finishing. But um, just when I lift, just compound movements. How about your cardio? I think uh, one thing that a lot of people have been paying attention to is VO2 max. Yeah. So is that something that you pay attention to much? What, what do you do for that? Yeah. So I started testing that when I turned 40. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that I've been able to increase my VO2 max every year. Um, so, but, but I don't like train for it necessarily. Mm-hmm. It's not like I'm like, okay, I do this many minutes of zone two or whatever. Um, I just try to walk and then run. And then in the summer, do a lot of hiking. Um, so we'll do a lot of backcountry hunting and then also hiking. And that I think has a lot of carryover because it's naturally like low intensity, very aerobic, increasing capillary density and things like that. But I think, you know, providing the structural base to then when you want to increase the intensity, you know, um, I think is very beneficial. Um, you know, I was just at, at Sean Baker's place, you know, doing, um, you know, the ski erg and the concept too. That's something I never really paid attention to. I thought that's just for CrossFitters, but that's been 
I think, really good just to switch up the cardio and doing whole body cardio. A lot of us will just do cardio for our legs. You know, the bodybuilders or fitness models will get on the stair mill, revolving stairs, and you're just improving the capillary density in your legs per se. Um, but then in, involving your upper body uh, in the cardio process, I think is really beneficial. So uh, in the winter, like cross-country skiing, you know, it's really good exercise for your core, for your back, your lats. And I think that it just makes a lot of sense for improving, you know, your VO2 max. Yeah. If you go kind of like top down, like if you're able to handle a lot of what Sean Baker does, then you can probably be very easy to go on a jog, you know, because yeah. he does a lot of sprinting type stuff. He does a lot of explosive stuff. So I think it's really important to stay in tune with that. I, I do think that uh, people need to be a little careful with it because it's very easy to hurt yourself if you haven't done that in a long time, if you're not practiced up on it. So uh, you might need to be cautious. You might need to start out with like some zone two just to kind of get your body used to some of that. Yeah. But I think, you know, one of the things that I've learned is as you become more cardiovascularly fit, it's easier to to preserve muscle, I feel like, because you're just improving nutrient delivery to your muscle tissue. I don't know. That's just been my, like, I used to think like, oh, cardio will make you smaller, right. you know, it's going to shrink. And it, you've but been I, working on getting bigger, right? I've been trying to, you know, um, not, not, I don't want to be like a mass monster or anything like that. The heaviest I've been was 235, but that was not natty. Wow. That was in college, right? So I was screwing around with Tren and Deca and Test <laughs> and all the bullshit, right? So um, why does everybody confess on this show? It's so funny. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, and part of the reason why I prioritize cardiovascular training now is because like I only did two cycles, but it you know, might've affected things in a negative mm -hmm. way. Just want to optimize cardiovascular health and and then testosterone, you know, so I'm, I don't do any, haven't done HRT or anything like that. I want to, you know, wait until as long as possible, but I've been able to improve my testosterone just with these different things that we've been talking about and maintain that healthy sex drive, morning erections, all that. So you're 190 pounds and what are you trying to, are you trying to get up to 200? I think just staying like this. Yeah. Like about 190. Um, for me, it's just more strength. I don't like the idea of, you know, um, getting weaker as I get older, you know, like we just, I have three younger brothers and we were just screwing around on Saturday at dinner. I had a, he, my brother has a pull-up bar outside of his bedroom and, and he was the one who was like, I hey, thought you were going to say you started fighting. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> we don't do that anymore. But he was like, yeah, let's do a pull-up contest. And I was like, okay. So I let them all go first and they petered out at like six, eight. And then I just cranked out 14 and they're like, well, you're the oldest. I'm like, yeah, well, just strength really matters, man. Right. Like well, you should be prioritizing this too. Yeah. So- uh, I've seen a uh, a handful of posts about you know your your progress from you know drinking to being alcohol free. What you know what I guess sparked that transition and how has that been? Yeah, well, so I was in Sima's age in that picture on the left. You know, definitely. Um, I I just I like the taste of red wine. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, and then just kind of like the anti anxiety effect of it. And so in my thirties, I would just sort of self medicate with wine. You know, um, I was like, you know, my my wife at the time didn't work. So it was just me. And, and so like, um, there was a lot of financial stress for me to like perform. And the, the way that I would sort of mitigate that was with alcohol. And I just found my sleep was shit. You know, I was gaining weight. My face was chubby, had you know, a little beer belly and everything like that. So in 2023, um, my friend, Dr. Jamie Seaman and OBGYN outside of Nebraska, we were out at a conference, Low Carb Denver, and everyone was drinking organic wine and all this. And I was participating in that. And she was like, I, I don't, I'm just taking a year off alcohol. And I was like, hmm, I think I could do it. Oh, I didn't think I could actually do it because I had never really, I'd always been a social drinker. And I'm like, all right, if you can do it, I'm going to try to do it. And so, yeah, I haven't had a drink since February of 2023. Um, and so I've just noticed, like, I just feel better. You know, I don't wake up, you know, feeling like I got ran over by a truck. I can remember my dreams, have morning wood, all this. So the way that I look at alcohol, is just like fast food, right? It's a short-term gratification, right? And, and you get a temporary buzz, just like eating an ice cream container. It feels good for the moment, but you're going to pay for that down the road. And so I think alcohol is, it's so accepted in our society. Every time you go out to dinner, any waitress or waiters can be like, what are you going to get to drink, sir or ma'am? And it's a lot of empty calories. Uh, a lot of the women that I've coached over the years in menopause, they struggle with sleep and weight issues. And sure enough, they're drinking half a bottle of wine at night in most cases, you know? Mm -hmm. So this is very common. It's widely abused. And I think people, a lot of people are not ready to take that step, right? To just cutting it out entirely. But I think if they can for 90 days, they're going to notice significant mm -hmm. sweeping changes in their life. Yeah. And I know you, you have like really, really good social circles, but like in those social settings, how have you been able to like, you know, kind of get around that? Because the second you start saying no, people start questioning everything. Yeah. But when you're, you know, fine, just 
you know, drinking and, and uh, really just kind of messing up your health. Nobody cares. So in those situations, how have you navigated that? You know, I just say, oh, thank you, but I, I don't, I don't drink, you know, or I'm not going to drink tonight. And um, I found in social situations, I, I perform better because what, what I would do um, even at a conference is I would have a two or three glasses of wine and I would feel like socially lubed up and, and like, oh, cool. And like, you know, more touchy and whatever, but maybe more outgoing, but you tend to lose your cognitive abilities, you know? And so you're not as quick. That person that you just met, you forget their name because you, you're buzzed. And so I find that I'm just like more engaging anyway. Mm -hmm. So I don't worry about it. You know, if someone gives me shit, I'm like, well, it's actually never happened. People now, I think people are recognizing that ethanol alcohol is a neurotoxin mm. and it causes changes within your brain, shrinks gray matter. Um, Daniel Amen has done a great job, a uh, neurologist out of Southern California, helping us to better understand that al alcohol is harmful with his spec scanning technology. So I think it's now people are getting it, you know, so I don't really get any blowback. And to be honest, like I, d I love whiskey. I love red wine, but I don't love it so much that I'm going to start mm -hmm. like, you know, just going binging on it. It's mm -hmm. like, you know what? maybe at a wedding once a year, have a little bit, but just be in control. That lack of control, I think as you get older, is just not something that I enjoy. You have supplements, you have a podcast. Where can people find all that? Where can they find out more information about you? Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, so my podcast YouTube channel is called High Intensity Health. So folks can check us out there. And then the uh, the product line, we do berberine, we do sleep formulations, we do creatine, it's called Myoscience. So. Awesome. Strength is never a weakness. Weakness is never strength. Catch you guys later. Bye.